Welcome, welcome, welcome to another edition of the Dr. James Show. I'm Dr. James Smith Jr. and I'm dating myself with this one. How many of you remember the Pointer Sisters? And one of their songs, I'm so excited. That's where I am today. One of my favorite people is our guest. So I'm looking forward to diving into that conversation and sharing his story. But I'm not going anywhere until I bring out my co-pilot, Shannon Pat. Shannon, it's that Tuesday again. TGIT. It's my favorite <laughs> day of the week. I know we love Friday, but listen, I am so excited. I know I say that every week. You do, you do. The guest today has so much excitement, so much charisma. But you know what, Dr. James? That is just only part of who he is because you know what? It's not just the personality. He's He's impacting community. I, I, I'm not. I'm not even going to. We're going to bring him out because there's so much to say. He's no stranger to the Dr. James Show. But ladies and gentlemen, if you are watching today, make sure you click on that chat button. You ask your questions. We're going to be covering some topics and information and asking questions. This is your opportunity to ask questions as well as make your comments. And within the hour, we're going to do our best to get them all in. So, I, I mean. I know I'm not going to want to land the plane after this hour. So not. I'm not, all I'm going to do is shut up, Dr. James, because you know what? There's just so much to cover. And Shannon, I don't think it's a coincidence that this person, he's so big in stature, physicality, and then he's the chief exec executive officer for Big Brothers Big South. Come on. I mean, oh, can he even fit in the Zoom window? I mean, do you think he actually has his his computer all the way across the room so we can Absolutely. we can actually fit him into this this little box on our screens? <laughs> there, it's there. Let's, let's let's bring him out right. Get this party started. Welcome, awesome. Chief Executive Officer, Big Brothers Big Sisters Independence. Uh, again, one of my favorite people in the whole world, Mr. Marcus Allen. Marcus, what's up? Why don't you come on out and join the show? Hey, brother. How are you, Jim? Man, I'm good. I'm good. And you? I am awesome. I am doing just fabulous today, man. It's a beautiful day out. We're at the start of spring. What is there not to be happy about? Okay. Carson, what's leaving? No, I won't even go there. <laughs> Don't do listen, it. Listen, <laughs> listen, listen. I want to jump into this right away because the time's going to fly by. I've known you for some time. We hang out. We support each other's businesses. I thought I knew everything about you, but I found out something I didn't know. Mm. I've done my research. And after we show this video clip, I want you to tell us what's happening here. What's happening? Let's show the video. The board has voted to close the following 23 schools. Mm. Uh-oh, I see some emotion. I see some emotion. <laughs> Tell you, we do our work, our homework. Wow. What was that about my brother Marcus Allen in a movie? Talk to us. <laughs> Listen, like, first of all, I am so shocked that you you know that and you pull that footage. <laughs> uh, yeah, man, uh, you, you know me, Jim. I'm always, like, I've always been uh, at least, uh, since I was a teenager, I always loved challenging myself and doing something different, right? And um, that uh, was a movie that I did called uh, the, uh, the Nomads. And it's actually a true story of a team, a uh, mostly black team that uh, played rugby. And there are so many just, uh, just amazing stories of overcoming and resilience. And as you know, me being someone who's all about kids, um, I, when, when the director came to me and said, Marcus, I want you to audition for this movie because I got a part that I think is perfect for you. Um, I initially, you know, said, no, I said, no, nah, man, you don't, you don't want me for that. Like you, you know, and cause I, I, that was never something that I ever thought about doing. Right. Jim, it wasn't one of those, those planned challenges that I do. And we can talk about some of my plan yeah, challenges that's, that's later. Coming, that's coming. <laughs> and, um, and so, and then he looked at me basically and said, man, stop being a punk. <laughs> <laughs> like, you can do it. And so I did it and, 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 and having like some real seasoned actors in that movie and getting the opportunity to work with Tika Sumter, 
uh, who's just one of the most beautiful people internally and externally I've ever met. And I've always had a, you know, a, a secret crush on her and to be able to work with her <laughs> on a movie set. It was amazing. And let me just say one thing that happened to me. So Please. because I've never done this before, they send you the script, right? And so, and, and I'm so busy at the time, so I'm still trying to do my job and also try to get ready for this, this movie thing. And they send me the script and I read the script and try to memorize the script in order of like when it happens in the movie. I didn't pay attention to the part they're saying, well, tomorrow you're going to do the end of the movie, right? And so I ended up like studying the, the script that wasn't the next day. So I get on set and they're like, okay, we're going to go through this. I'm saying, ho, ho, ho. Mr. Director, <laughs> I, didn't remember, I didn't remember that part. Please, I remember please. Right? This other oh, week. No. oh my God, Jim, it was so all oh, humbling. And they gave me a moment to, you know, go and, and do my thing and come back on. And we got through it. But uh, it was uh, one of the, it, it's an experience I'll never forget, right? Mm. And it is something that, for me, just really continues to underscore and reinforce this idea of putting yourself in situations where failure is a, is, is a high probability. And what I mean by that, you know, I talk to my girls, my, my kids all the time about, you know, what did you fail at this week? And, 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 and this idea that you need to get comfortable with failing and get comfortable with understanding that it's not the failing or the falling, it's the getting back up, yeah. right? And that continues to develop us and strengthen us and stretch us, right? Well, and so you, that was an example for me. You've been doing that since you were a teenager. Yeah. What, what contributed to that? Because I always wanted to ask you, and I, I forget, but now since I'm mm -hmm. ready today and I've done my homework, I wanted to ask you, when did that start? Why did it start? Because you and challenges are synonymous. You yeah. just go after them. You devour them. You attack them. Was there some one thing that contributed to that, or did someone dare you to do something? What? I, don't know, I, I think it was a confluence and a and a and a, a culmination of a lot of different things that that continued to happen. But I think it first started with an attitude, the attitude of, okay, so what? The attitude of, well, what's next? the attitude of looking for the silver lining, right? And I've always, as far as I can remember, always had this attitude like, okay, that's not the worst thing ever, right? Or I'm gonna get over that, I'm gonna get past that. And so as different challenges kept happening, um, I was doing something that psychologists uh, uh, asked people who dealt with traumatic situations to do. And that was, I was, without anyone telling me, I was reframing my story. Mm. Right. And looking at it from a positive lens versus a deficit lens. Right. And so wow. when <clears throat> um, my mom, she she tells this story of uh, when I was born and, and I had this disease in my legs and the doctor told my mom that I would um, never play ball or play sports or walk properly. And as I began to age and I started to play, you know, 10 years old, I played midget league football you know, my name was Marcus Allen at the time. Marcus <laughs> Allen was becoming big. And so I was just like, I thought I was supposed to be a running back. Uh, and I was pretty good at it. And, and, and I remember my mom making a statement when I was younger. And I remember her saying this. Uh, she said, um, one of the things I know about Marcus, if you tell him no, that gives him the fuel to do it anyway. And she said, a white man told my infant child, said a limitation on my child telling him what he wasn't going to do or be. And ever since then, Marcus, you've always tried to prove people wrong who count you out. And so I think with that attitude and my mom saying that to me and, and a host of mentors in the village just surrounding me through some major, major challenges that, and all of us have them, right? We all have like defining things that happen in our lives. And, and many times those defining things are not what's defining your your destination right. is defining right. who you are and your character that will eventually decide your destination, right? Okay. And so for me, that that's how I kind of see my life playing out. You mentioned strengthening yourself. What three things would you say can help people and, and kids strengthen themselves? 
So um, I, I think first I'll start off with again with attitude. I think out, attitude is your is your out, determines your altitude. I think Jesse Jackson may have said that um, or some version of that. Um, I truly believe that. I think two is uh, the people around you, right? Uh, Steve Harvey once said that you know if you tell me a uh, describe the five uh, closest people to you, right? And when you describe those five closest people, you just told me who you are, right? And so I think secondly, you wanna make sure you put yourself around people who inspire you, who you wanna be like, who are doing the things that you wish you could do, right? And then third, having a faith base, whatever that is, you can be agnostic, you can be atheist, but having something that you believe in that's bigger than you. Right. Um, I think what propels me is knowing that all of this stuff doesn't happen because of me. There's something else at work, at play, and it, it keeps us uh, humble. It keeps us gracious. I uh, just heard a pastor say the other day, he said, three things that hold people back is bad theology, bad thinking, and bad thinking. Right. Ooh. And the bad thinking is not knowing how to be uh, gracious and grateful for things. That's good. That is so stuff. good. good stuff. Anything that is else so there, good. Shannon? Anything else? I think inquiring minds want to know out of all the organizations that are out there that make an impact, that make an impression, why big brothers and big sisters? Listen. Um, Hold on. Give me a three syllable. L listen. <laughs> <laughs> He's thanking. I, I just feel, you know, I, I have so much love and affection for Big Brothers, Big Sisters and the mission that we have. Um, first of all, I am a, 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 a social justice warrior just by nature. I think I was born to be a social justice advocate. Um, and many people don't know this, Big Brothers, Big Sisters was born as a social justice organization in 1904 in New York when a judge saw 10 kids who were, they wanted to send away to reformatory school, which is what they did back a hundred years ago. And he said, instead of sending those kids to reformatory school, he asked 10 men in the courtroom to stand up and volunteer to be mentors in their program, uh, be mentors to those 10 kids. And so for me, Big Brothers Big Sisters is at the essence of what I am about. Um, and, and what I love about it is not about general mentoring. It's not about group mentoring. It's about that one-on-one -on -one relationship that focuses on consistency and focuses on uh, length. The average uh, mentor-mentee uh, match in our in our program lasts almost three years. Ooh. So we are not, we're no longer about like when people say mentoring is something nice. No, mentoring is something necessary. And so we're not about spending time with kids. We are about investing in kids. And there's a, a huge difference in saying, I'm going to spend time with you versus I'm going to invest in you. And I'm going to invest in you not for one month, not for one year. And I'm not saying everybody does this, but on average, we tell uh, mentees, mentors, don't come here if you can't commit to at least a year. And on average, our people are staying three years. We have some people who've been uh, uh, matched and staying in contact for 40, 50 years. Wow. So this is, when you talk about Big Brothers Big Sisters, man, like, listen, this organization, and I'm not just saying this because I'm the CEO, like, I love what we do, what we stand for, and the impact we're having on thousands of people across the country. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Shannon. Marcus, you said CEO. You're also the first Black CEO of the independence region. Does that bring extra pressure or, again, just another challenge? Just another challenge. Um, you know, as you can imagine, there's a reason why I'm the first Black CEO in 100 years. Um, and so understand that there are structures and things in place that um, did not, like today you see a lot of uh, frenetic energy around uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and, 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 and being more serious about supporting people of color um, in, in executive roles. Uh, when I took over in 2013, that wasn't necessarily the case. Uh, and, you know, coming in, running an organization that is probably, you know, still about 80% white um, with the board that's mostly white, but serving a mostly uh, black and brown community has its inherent challenges, not because of the color of the skin, but because of different people's experience. And so as a black man being thrust into this environment, you know, it is incumbent upon me 
to understand that I'm here for all people and but not all people are going to see me the same, <laughs> right? right? And so um, I have to enter into conversations, into environments, into, into challenges with this understanding of being fully aware of who I am mm -hmm. and being confident to bring my authentic self to the table and being okay with, if that's not enough, then that has nothing to do with me. That's none of my business, sure. right? <laughs> right. What, what I got to concern myself, and as the young people say, is, you know, as I stay in my lane and, try, and I'm trying to get all the way out of the way of drama and all the other stuff, but as a black man, I know what I'm bringing to the table. And I, and I, and I can't, for those who may hear this and think, well, why is it that you always, you know, or, or certain people want to focus on their race, right? I don't want to focus on my race. I really don't. But I live in America. Right. And, if, 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 and, I, and I can't fool myself into thinking that my race isn't a factor in every aspect of my life. Right. I can't even fool myself into thinking that my race don't affect me. <laughs> right. Like I, I told a guy, you know, who came to when I first took this job, you know, they, they have this thing called key person insurance, key man, key woman insurance. Yeah. So that is the corporation or the entity wants to insure your, your life so that if something happens to you, like they are not irreparably harmed from a financial perspective. And so they want to take out a million dollar policy on me when I got this job. And so they sent out the person, the nurse to do your vitals and all that stuff. And he said to me, Marcus, he said, you look like you're a shape, you're cut, you're, you, he said, but inevitably when I hook this stuff up to you and start taking your vitals, Normally, I see, you know, something comes up, particularly with black folks. And this was a white guy saying this, right? Mm -hmm. So he took my vitals, everything, and everything was, like, awesome. Excellent, excellent health, the whole nine. And I said to him, I said, let me ask you a question. I said, why did you say that, right? He said, well, many times when I, you know, do the, the analysis of black people from a health perspective, they seem to have lower health indicators than my white um, clients. I said, he said, why do you think that is? I said, I'll tell you my hypothesis on that. I said, let me ask you a question first. How often do you think of yourself as a white man? And he said, I said, in a given month. And he said, never. I said, well, I think of myself as a black man every day yeah. and every moment of the day. I said, I even think of me being black. I dream me being black, right? <laughs> I said, so for people who look like me that have not accepted the reality yeah. and seeing the positive of being black, that stress causes so many other challenges. And that's why it's so important as a black man, black woman, brown woman, brown man, that we create welcoming, inviting environments so that, that we possible? don't unintentionally put stress on people. Is that possible? Will we get there as we think about race and the future, race relations in the future? Will we get there? I, I, I don't know if we'll get there, but I know it's possible if we really want to, right? If, 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 we, if we really wanted to solve racism, we could because we invented it. And when I say we, you know, I'm, I'm saying people, um, you, you, you know, not to go too deep into this, but, you know, many believe that racism started when the Catholic Church allowed the Portuguese to go and start enslaving Africans back in 14, mid 1400s, right? <laughs> Um, and, and since then you've seen some of the worst atrocities as it related to skin color. And also some, some would even argue our hair texture as well. Yeah. Um, I believe that we could solve racism, not with the adults. Ooh. I believe we can solve it in a generation if we really focused on getting rid of it with our seeds, our, our, our kids, our young kids, our, you know, infants to about five years old and start to really be intentional about educating them like there is no difference, that we all come from the same, we all originated in Africa. Every person on this earth, no matter what you say, I, and I learned this in anthropology, they have at least 2% African DNA. So that means that we all originated from Africa, Northern Africa to be exact, right? And so like just knowing that I think empowers young people to see past 
race and see, you know what? We're really the same. We just look different. It's like I got dogs. I got a brown dog. I got a black dog, right? <laughs> they both they both cockapoos. They both poodles. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, they just got different skin color, right? And that, actually, they only have different skin color. They just got different coating. Like, their hair is different. That's all. <laughs> I'm going to put a picture up there of, of you and one of your heroes. Mm. And I'd like for you to talk about the impact this person has had on your life and how it plays a role with you dealing with social justice, with you speaking to diversity, equity, inclusion, to you doing some of the other work that you do. So let's take a look at this picture of you and one of your heroes, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Ah, uh-oh, uh -oh. smile the heart. Talk to us, Mark, what's happening here? Hey, man. Um, first of all, I just want to tell you, everyone listening, like, this is all surprise to me. I didn't know Jim was going to be doing all of this. Um, but yeah, I, like, Dr. King for me is so poignant because he didn't live a perfect life. Mm. Um, he had challenges mm -hmm. that he had to overcome, not just as a young person growing up, but throughout his life. And uh, when he died, he wasn't as beloved as he is today, right? If you do any research on Dr. King, you know he had issues with the Southern Leadership Christian Council. He had issues with the federal government. He had issues with other pastors. As a matter of fact, at the time, he wasn't even considered the most, the, the best orator, right? He was considered somewhat average, right? Yet and still, what he accomplished in his very short amount of time on this earth will never be forgotten, right? The sort of things that he espoused for humanity, not just for black folks, but for humanity, right? To me is timeless. Mm. Um, the If you read any of his books and any of his, his, his writings, like this man was able, like we, you know, we, I'm not saying that the things that we're dealing with today with the George Floyd murders, the Breonna Taylors, the, all of that stuff is, is horrible. But what they were dealing with in the 60s and 50s and even prior to that without social media, without all of this stuff being captured the way it is, and to continue to say, like, you hose me, you, your dogs bite me, you beat me, you jail me. And I am still gonna love you. Mm, like Jim, mm, I, mm, I, I don't even like. I want that. <laughs> you know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, me too. Me too. I, I want that. Like, listen, I, I, I was doing a, a sermon for my church uh, back home in Thompson, Georgia. Oh, um, you're, not, you're, not, you're, not, you're not gonna run through that red light. <laughs> you did a sermon. Yes. Yeah, man. Yeah, God's working on me, Jim. And, and, and I said to the, to the congregation, this is the church that I was raised in. And I had been there since my grandmother died several years ago. And, and I remember, and I was talking about, like, I remember sitting over there and I was five years old and I'm going through it. But, but before I got into the sermon, I said, listen, I am 85% saved. <laughs> right? So I, I, just, I want to set the expectations here at church, right? Because uh, I do not want to get up here and degrade this pulpit. <laughs> And, and this holy space, um, because I am still growing mm. and I make mistakes. And I think it's important for people like yourself, Jim, myself, and others who have followers and influence that, you know, we, we have to, like, in order for us to, to be inviting to allow people to be authentic, we must also show them that we are not perfect and that we have to fight against anyone putting us on pedestals, right? Yeah. And that kind of goes to what we do at Big Brothers Big Sisters when we talk about white saviorism. And a lot, and I've gotten a lot of flack from people when I talk about white saviorism. And this is not a this is a, a a term that I did not coin. This is a a a legitimate um, uh, issue in our country. Psychology talks about it. If you know anything about like evidence based programming and and critical mentoring. All the researchers and the experts speak to this thing called 
white saviorism. And also, of course, there's black saviorism, but we're talking about America and we're talking about what's most pervasive. Right. Right. And and I was honest with our Big Brothers Big Sisters board and other folks. I said, listen, Big Brothers Big Sisters, like we delved into that currency. Like we benefited from the currency of white saviorism. Or when we look at movies and you see it's all, you know, normally a white person going into a black community saving black kids. Which when I did Nomads, that was one of the reasons I said yes, because Tika Barber, a black woman, was right. going into North Philly to right. save those kids in North Philly. Not save them, but to, to, to help them. Uh, because I also always say, like, listen, um, I only know one savior, and that man is dead, and that's Jesus Christ. So I am a far, far be it for me to even have anyone think of me or anyone else as savior, saviors. Sure. And so we have to walk circumspectly with our kids and our families, walk humbly with them if you're in this work so that we can help do some of the blocking and tackling as they navigate this thing called life. So yeah, Martin Luther King, he does it for me. I I, I don't care. Like, don't nobody say that bad about Dr. King. <laughs> you know? Because yes, he's not perfect. Yes, he he did a number of things that you know people and the CIA and other people put him out on front street. But yeah. let me ask you a question. If 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 you had a spotlight on you and you had people following you and looking at everything you do, what is your record gonna look like? Like oh, what would come out about you if you absolutely. were judged on your very worst day and that was what people were going to remember you by? Absolutely. Absolutely. Shannon, come and join the party. Marcus putting it down. He's putting it down. <laughs> Can't even preach it in here. I mean, my, my, ink, my ink is running out of my pen. I'm taking notes <laughs> over here. The chat room is lighting up. Folks are saying, first of all, um, folks are saying over here and then want to give a shout out to way to represent the big guys, Marcus. And, uh, <laughs> Is that Donovan West? That was D West, D West. <laughs> That's my man. Um, so we also have, you know, can't wait to mentor again by one of our viewers and saying, you know, mentored one of Big Brothers, Big Sisters for nine years. Oh, wow. um, love the idea of investing in others. We all need to look at things like, like you're looking at it with everyone we interact with, but especially with children. Um, the importance of mentoring to a child's future can't be overestimated. Thank you for your part in this, Marcus. I mean, it goes on and on. How would you advise someone how to bring his or her authentic self to the table since you did that with Big Brothers Big Sisters? Um, how would I advise? And, and you do this, all, we've had this conversation, you do this all the time because you speak in front of audiences where you don't go PC. And to me, PC means poor communication. You share what's on your heart, you share what's on your mind, and people listen. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I have to be cautious in how I answer that one, though, Shannon, right? Because I had someone tell me a while ago, and I was talking about my son with one of my best friends, and he said, Marcus, like, you know, you have a confidence that is, you know, it's not an average confidence, right? Uh, and part of your confidence was built on maybe because you were a hell of, an a hell of an athlete. Now, you worked hard for it, but you became an athlete and you got accolades. And so that helps, right, as you go through life and you keep getting things and, and that validation from folks, right? Uh, and then over time, you learn with wisdom that, you know what, I am not looking for validation from people, right? My validation comes from within me, not from without me, right? Um, and so... <clears throat> I, I think, yeah, it, it, I don't know how to word this, but internal strength, um, relying on figuring out a way to, you know, I remember when the pandemic first hit and I posted something on my social media page and I said, um, um, uh, now that we have to go uh, in, now it's time to go really in within ourselves right and so the pandemic for a whole year forced many of us to spend time with ourselves hopefully and so for me i was able to like really talk to myself and think through things i made some mistakes and, and then but one of the things that i would tell people in order to to answer your question shannon i believe uh, the best way to be authentic and to feel safe having that psychological safety in that authenticity is to monitor your thoughts, right? 
And that sounds simple, but it is not, I promise you. And, and, and maybe some of it goes to this whole notion of mindfulness. Um, and I've read that, I understand that, but for me, it goes a little bit deeper than that. And so you have to be on guard at all times about your thoughts. Because if you aren't paying attention to your thoughts, at some point, those thoughts become words. And then when they become words, they become action. And when they become action, they become your behavior. And when they become your behavior, they become your character. And so for me, I, I think it's important for people, if you want to experience this freedom of being authentic, regardless of your environment, right? Because if you are, can only be authentic based on where you are, then that's not authenticity at all. Right. That is going back to what you said, Shannon, before we got on this call about the imposter syndrome, where we're trying to be something that we're not to fit in, but we don't belong. Right. Yes. And so I think it's so important for us to start basically with like just sitting with yourself. And, 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 and sometimes you have the urge to go negative because so much negative stuff is playing on us every day. Yeah. And going back to Dr. King, think about the negative stuff that played on him. And think about what he had to do as he went inside to stay focused on his thoughts because he was also focused on other folks. Because ultimately, your authenticity, and this is my philosophy, your authenticity should be about how can I be my best self to best serve others, mm. right? Mm. And when you have that, then now it doesn't matter what the, you know, it, it does matter, but it, it doesn't impact you as much sure, sure. when people come to persecute you, when people come and they, they're talking about you, because it's going to come. The more, like, I was told, like, you know, anytime, and you can go back in any parts of history, the Bible, the Quran, all of it, anytime you have a person who's building, if you got a shovel in one hand, you better have a sword in the other hand, because people are coming to fight you. They only fight you and come against you when you're building something, whether that's your, your reputation, mm -hmm. if it's a, a physical building, you're trying to build a legacy, you're trying to build wealth, whatever you're trying to build is going to invite tension and confrontation. And yes. so you have to realize that and be authentic in why you're really doing it. And when you know your purpose, mm -hmm. like when you are like focused on your thoughts and you know your purpose, and you, you, you are going about your business, as those things start to come at you, you become, and I tell my kids this all the time, uh, instead of being a thermometer, you become a thermostat, right? A thermometer measures the temperature in the room. A thermostat sets the temperature in the room. And so our whole thing is how do we make sure we continue to be thermostats? Yes, it's my job as a CEO to say, okay, I want to create a welcoming environment for folks. But it's also, what I didn't tell you, it's also your job to set the room, right? Because you're a leader as well. Setting the room. Shannon, thank you. Setting the room. Marcus, you were just talking about psychological safety and fighting. What went on in your mind when you decided that you wanted to take on Apollo Creed? I got a video that I want to show people. I, I, wanna, I know you're courageous, you're confident, but you decided... In what was going on? You decided to take on Apollo Creed. <laughs> Let me tell you something, man. Apollo Creed is one of my all-time best actors and characters oh, in the is. Rocky movie. Like, I liked Apollo Creed, obviously, more than I like Rocky because he symbolized that Black people can compete, right? He symbolized that, like, we can work just as hard. Like, the one Rocky, I forget, it was either, I think it was one or two when they, they tied, right? So it was like, you already know Rocky's the, the star of the movie, right? <laughs> but for this black man to come on the scene and be like, no, I know you're the star, but you ain't winning this one, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, he, he, he was just phenomenal for me as a uh, 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 that, that mentor from far away who I had never met, 
right? And to get the opportunity to, and we ran into each other randomly. Like I ran into him. We both were uh, 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 doing something at the radio station and he had, he just happened to be there, right? And I was like, you ain't gonna believe this, right? And here's the, here's the crazy thing about frequency and universe. And no, 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 what, what, was, what, was crazy, what was crazy was, you didn't just give him a pound, high five, handshake. You put your hands up. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> but but guess why though, Jim? At the time, I was training for my own fight. That's right. Right. And so I was about to go in and fight a guy who had 20 years experience. I had never been in a boxing ring before. And so I was asking him, like, yo, man, I'm about to go. I'm, I'm, I'm a little scared, right? I ain't gonna lie. Yeah, I know I'm six seven, but I'm scared, right? And, and so he was just like, uh, let me see what you got. And that's when we just start bouncing around. And so it just like, listen, man, I, I am, I have had one of the most blessed lives, man. Uh, like I, I could have never imagined or dreamed of the experiences that I've had, Jim. And this is just, we've only touched a little bit. And I'm not trying to brag, but God has been good to me, brother. When mm. I tell you, the people he put me in front of sitting on Oprah Winfrey's show. I'm glad you don't have the tape of that. Um, <laughs> like, you know, show's not over. Show's not over. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, it's it's it, it's it. But what's what's just as important though as meeting those people and having those experiences is being prepared for those, right? And so where it's to the point where I may have idolized you, or you're like in my head, you're my mentor. Right. But having that internal confidence to say, but just because you're that, it doesn't make you any better than me. Right. And, and what I found in, in, in my in, in my experiences with celebrities and influencers and leaders has been you give them permission to be comfortable around you when you don't put them on a pedestal. Right. Because I've been that person that people put on a pedestal. And it just, it's uncomforting, right? It's just like, no, like, no, 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 don't treat me like that. Like, we, like, treat me, or we're on the same level, right? right? And, and I try to make sure I do that with people, no matter how much, you know, I get, like, I remember we, you know, uh, we were at a concert and we were standing, like, me and my kids were standing right next to Jay-Z, Beyonce, uh, Anthony, uh, Carmelo Anthony, um, the other rest of Destiny's Child, um, Sasha and Malia, uh, Obama. And so my kids, like, they're crying, Jim. Like, mm -hmm. like one of them was just, and I, and, and I have that on video too, where she was just, oh my God, daddy, Beyonce is standing right there. I was just like, if you keep crying, she gonna leave. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> you know? Uh, but, it, and, 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 and what happened was, because I was so cool, like, Sasha and Malia came over, and, and I think it was Sasha, like, She's crying in my arms because Chance the Rapper is performing. And she said, oh, I love him. And I was like, I'm sure your dad uh, would approve of him because he's a good rapper. Like, he's, he, he, he talks about gospel and all that stuff. But I think when you're authentic and you, you, you have confidence in yourself, then it invites other people, no matter what their status is, to be comfortable right. around you. Yeah, that's... that's... In, in terms of... I'm going to segue from being comfortable to being uncomfortable because last year caught many of us off guard. The pandemic wasn't trending. It just, bam, jumped on us. Right. How did it impact your leadership or your leadership style? What was that like for you last year, considering you CEO, major organization, and you still had to lead? Yeah, um, for me, it was exciting. I know, and I, and I say that in all... Um, with, with the grace of understanding that people went through a lot of challenges. We lost a lot of people um, through that process. Um, um, yet and still, um, I saw that as another storm that we all had to go through. And as a leader, um, I relished the moments when I'm tested. Because how do you know you're a good leader unless you're tested. You relish right? the moments when you're tested. That's hot. That's good. Yeah, it's true though. You know, it, it is true. I um and not and not to be insensitive to people's struggle and 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 people's um 
burdens that they, you know, we all have our burdens, right? Like life is life is part of, you know, there's long suffering for for all of us. Um, and so there's different degrees of it. Um, and if there's anything that's consistent in life, it is there will always be a storm. Mm. Right? It's either you haven't seen it yet or you're in it, but there will always be a storm, my friend. And so as leaders, we have to always, you know, it's like training. Um, your your practice is always harder than the game. Yeah. Right. And so I've had a lot of practice, Jim. Right. Uh, some of it I I designed my obstacles and challenges for myself, and others it got thrown on me. Either way, I had to deal with it, um, and because of my optimist, I, I'm a relentless optimist, Love and that. because of that, it has. <clears throat> the pandemic uh, spoke to me differently. It spoke to me and said, well, Marcus, I don't think we're doing enough for our families. And my team, my leadership team at Big Brothers and and our staff said, okay, let's go deeper. And so we started to do more stuff with the families, right? Um, it said, okay, um, we need to innovate with our technology and make sure our staff were up to speed and ready to go. We had to do that. All right, how do we make it like we understood that the school district was having challenges with engaging kids online. So we say, okay, how can we make it more fun and, 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 and more engaging? Um, and, and, and I'm not saying we don't have our challenges with it because we do, but it, it forced us to say, are we doing enough, right? And I think if it were not for the pandemic, we wouldn't have pushed ourselves to go deeper and broader with our families the way we have uh, with our community care packages that we're doing. We just, this past Saturday, just delivered a hundred um, meals on uh, PPE and all kinds of stuff to our families. Um, and that was the sixth one we've done over 600 families. We've done thus far over 3000 meals. Um, and, and we're not, we're not a food bank. We're not a organization that focuses on that. But at the end of the day, our mission, and some people say, well, Marcus, I, we believe that's mission creep. Well, let me tell you something. Our mission says that we want to ignite the promise and potential of our young people. Where in that does it say that you let them starve to get to their promise and potential? Where in that does it say you let them be unnecessarily exposed to the coronavirus, right? Where in that does it say that you don't have compassion because you've been around 100 years and you have resources and partners who are willing to give you this stuff? Only thing we're asking you to do is figure out the logistics on how that's going to happen and utilize your, your amazing volunteers who are always asking, Marcus, I, I don't have time to be a big, but what other ways can I get involved with yeah. your organization? Yeah. Right, we can plug and play now. We can, we hey, you don't have hard. Life ain't hard. We got this going on over here, man. We got bigs, uh, a black bigs affinity group. We got you know LGBTQ that we're doing in all this uh, many of the school districts in this area. So we have all these things, but some of those came from the pandemic. All right, came from the pandemic, Jim. And so I, I am, in my mind, a better leader. And uh, March twenty third of twenty twenty one than I was March twenty third twenty twenty. Nice, nice. I'm gonna borrow and steal your phrase, relentless optimism. I love it. I love it. Shannon, your thoughts? Uh, I'm, I'm over. You taking notes? You taking notes, right? <laughs> because I'm just thinking of our current climate, youth today, and I'm thinking of. Marcus and influence is such a powerful thing with our youth today. And what came to mind as I'm sitting here and I'm giggling to myself because I'm thinking to myself, Dr. James Marcus, Marcus is the OG of influencers. You know what I'm saying? Because if he had, a, if you were growing up now, you would have tweet tweets and twit. You'd be the top of Twitter. I mean, right or wrong, because he has such an ability to influence and you're reaching our youth and you you just connect. Like what a God given talent. I imagine even as a kid, you had a heart for the underdog or the, the you know, you could, this relatability that you have that's coming through the screen. I couldn't imagine 
What a sister's trying to say is, can you mentor me, Marcus? <laughs> Am I too old for Big Brother? <laughs> we finally got to the point. You got to authenticity. Can you be my mentor? <laughs> I, just, I love it. I love it. A actually, Shannon, it. after what you said to me before this call, I was thinking about asking you to be my mentor. <laughs> <laughs> I love no, I, I, I love your heart. I love what you do and what an inspiration. And folks are saying, you know, preach. You know, they're just like they're I always say to Dr. James when I when I attend the show and it's like all these nuggets and you're just, you know, you're just it's so rich. And, um, you know, bringing your heart and, and bringing your soul and your capabilities. And then, Dr. James, you you add ability on top of all Marcus has going on. I mean, he he is a force to be reckoned with and, and we are humbled to have you share yourself with us today. So, um, and somebody else is saying, you know, Marcus has a deep heart for sure. I mean, to just, they're lighting up the chat. One day we might be saying, Mayor Marcus. <laughs> Mayor Marcus. Don't wish that on me. Don't wish that on me, Jim. <laughs> you know God has a sense of humor. You <laughs> oh, oh my God. <laughs> Thank you, Shannon. Marcus, we got a, a lot more to do in a short period of time. So we get through. We're going to do this. I'll put some pictures up there. Uh, I think many of them are current. I'd like for you to tell us what's happening in, okay. in the pictures that we feature right now. So let's take a look. What's happening here? So that was a, um, a ride I did uh, last year, Black Lives Matter ride. Mm -hmm. We did from uh, New York uh to dc um uh, a little bit over 300 miles in five days that wow. group you see me standing there with uh with uh, both of my hands in the air those are some young folks that i jim i if i'm also very random <laughs> right and so those <laughs> are some young people i met out when i was riding my bike at kelly drive and wow. i saw them in these t-shirts and i asked them a question they said follow us on instagram i start following them on instagram three weeks later i find myself uh going up to New York and meeting with them. And then we took a bike ride all the way down to DC and, and those young people really inspired me. And then on the left with my right hand raised, that was at, um, uh, 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 we, when we got to DC, we met up with Al Sharpton and his team. Right. And, and so we uh, ended up being a part of 200,000 person uh, march, which was a commemoration of the 50th year when uh, Martin Luther King marched on the Capitol. Mm, mm, I love your randomness. How about this picture right here? Uh, that was a part of that ride. So that's uh, part of my team. Uh, we were uh, team eight. And I was, uh, of course, I was the oldest person uh, <laughs> in the group. And so they always talk about it. I said, man, you have so much energy. So every morning at five o'clock, I would get up. And some days, two days we had, we stayed in hotels. Three nights we stayed out uh, mm. on campgrounds and tents. And I, would get up and, like, <laughs> <laughs> and I would get up and say, hey, team eight, let's be great. And so uh, the picture of the right is, is us doing what they call Three Mile Hill. And this is after uh, we were, we went up this long, steep hill. And this is my first time really on a bike like that. And so that was a huge accomplishment for me. Um, and one of the things I said on that bike ride was I am not getting off my bike, which meant no matter how tough the course was, no matter how, how much elevation, I wasn't going to uh, do a unplanned stop, meaning no matter how tired I was going to get, I was going to keep pedaling. And for five days, I didn't stop pedaling except for the official stops that we had. And Mark, are, are the, these rides getting you ready for your miles for mentoring? I believe yes. that's in the offing, right? Yep. So we are um, from this. I was inspired to go across country, and so now I'm starting my what we call Miles for Mentoring ride, um, which will start June 5th in San Francisco, and we will ride 3,800 miles to uh, Atlantic City, um, about 47, 48 days, um, uh, averaging about 87 miles a day. Um, a lot of elevation. As you can imagine, as we go through the Rockies and all of that stuff. Um, but for me, I think it's important for to get the word out. We have 30,000 kids on a waiting list across the country for Big Brothers and Big Sisters. Wow. And so my goal here is to raise awareness about what's happening with our kids and families across the country, as well as what's happening with them here in Philadelphia. And this is my, 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 my donation back to an organization that's done so much for me. 
and to kind of put my money where my mouth is, right? Say, I'm not just going to try to inspire people with my words, but I think it's also important to inspire people with action. And Martin Luther King, he didn't just inspire with his words. He marched. He did physical stuff. And sometimes people look, they, they don't see the importance of doing stuff like that, right? But that's the stuff that people remember. They may not remember what you say. Right. Uh, and I know my Angelo said they remember what you, how you made them feel. But I also think uh, second behind that, they remember what you do, right? And I hope this will inspire young people and others to, you know, uh, believe in what they believe in terms of serving people and going out and doing it. Well, can continue with the inspiration theme. Tell me about the NFL big draft recruiting for male mentors. What's, what's going on there? So, yeah, so um, I went up to New York uh, several years ago, three years ago with our national CEO. I met with Roger Goodell's team. And uh, one of the things we wanted to do is form this relationship with the NFL um, because of people like Rodney McLeod and Malcolm Jenkins and other NFL players with the Players Coalition. They had raised all this money um, to, to give back to the community. And we were lucky enough to be one of a few nonprofits chosen by the NFL um, to support um, what we're trying to do in terms of putting care and compassion adults in the lives of kids. I don't know if you remember back in 2018 um, when I think um, uh, Maroon 5 performed. Uh, the NFL Maroon gave us five. half a million dollars. Yeah. Maroon 5 mashed it with another half a million because they were so inspired by what we were doing in the community. And so the Players Coalition really made the decision, which I'm most proud of. It wasn't the NFL, it was the Players Coalition. And, and at the time, this is like not long after Colin Kaepernick had knee, uh, uh, took a knee, yeah. and they were really about social justice. So for them to choose Big Brothers Big Sisters to be a part of this, and this NFL draft is about us, as we lead up to the NFL draft, we'll treat our bigs who come on board like they're getting drafted, right? Mm -hmm. So we have t-shirts for them and like you're being drafted and it is something important that you're going to do. More important than, you know, multi-million dollar contract playing the NFL <laughs> <laughs> because you are going to change the future of this country one child at a time. This is amazing. Time has gotten away. We haven't talked about your beautiful girls, your son, you playing pro basketball in the NBA overseas, how you got to Philly. But one of the biggest lessons I got from your time with us today is we need to hang out more. I mean, you're hanging out with Roger Goodell, Beyonce, Jay-Z, the Obama daughter. Like, can you give a brother a call? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, my friend. I would love for us to spend more time together. All right. And, and also, and, and I'm going to put you on the spot. Jim has has offered to help me in this in this in this ride that I'm doing. Um, my goal is to write a book um, during this ride that kind of symbolizes some of the stuff we talked about here today, as well as what I'll learn on this ride. And so um, Jim has, 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 has offered his services to me and I am taking him up on that. So <laughs> recording now, it, this, recording it. <laughs> this, this group can hold us accountable for that. I love it. Listen, we're at the point of the show where, since I already know you're a sought after speaker, you speak on social justice, you speak on diversity, equity, and inclusion. This is the mini, M-I-N-I, -I, the mini keynote portion of the show. So you have 30 seconds. I want you to look right at that camera and you could speak on social justice. You can speak on diversity, equity, inclusion. You can speak on being relentless, a call to action, whatever. Marcus Allen, your mini keynote presentation starts now. Thank you, Jim. I want to thank you, Jim Shannon, for allowing me to have this, this opportunity. Um, my, my main focus, what I am most passionate about is our young people. And I believe that it is our duty to make sure that we protect those seeds. Growing up down south, what I understood, we had a garden in our backyard and we understood no matter, it wasn't about the seeds, like the health of the seeds, it was about the soil that the seeds were going to be planted in. And so as we continue to move forward in our lives, if we are not paying attention to the soil that we're planting our seeds in, then we will not have a future. There's a tribe in Africa that I was told by one of my mentors that says they don't even greet you by saying hello, hi, good morning in Africa. Their greeting to you is, how are the kids? And so, Jim, to you and all your listeners, what I would ask them, and you can answer this in, in, in your own internal voice in your head, but I would ask you, how are the kids, right? How are the kids? 
because however our kids are, that determines our future. And so if you're not doing something each and every day that is helping to make sure we keep this soil fertile, then you are not helping us to ensure a healthy and prosperous future for this country. Thank you. Shannon, mic drop, mic drop, mic drop. We know you by your fruit. And if I was with you in person today, we were doing this, I, my shoes would be dirty because I'd be <laughs> stepping all over the fruit that you're producing. <laughs> so thank you for walking it out and not just saying it, but doing it. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Listen, Marcus, you did it again. Every time we're together, you do it again. Uh, you're one of the people who don't attempt to get to the next level. You're not stopping. So you put the S on level, levels, and you keep going. Thank you for your pearls. Thank you for your Marcus moments and your Marcus magic. You did it again. Each week, Shannon and I said we get better and get better, get better, and we did it again. For those of you who are watching, wow. He put it down, didn't he? Dropped that mic several times. But don't lose sight of what he said. Take care of the soil. Take care of the children. In order to do that first, you got to take care of you. That's self-care. You take care of you, then you'll be ready to take care of everyone else. We'll see you back here next week. And don't forget, you've just been gym packed.